All right. Well, welcome to the series that I'm calling Reflections for Pharmacy Leaders Advancing the Profession. It's my pleasure this morning to welcome uh, Sarah White. Sarah White is considered a leader in health system pharmacy. Uh, she's currently a faculty member with the ASHP Education and Research Foundations, the Pharmacy Leadership and Academic Leaders Innovation Master Series and a Pharmacy Leadership Coach. I've got all those titles there, I think. Uh, she completed her Master's in Residency at Ohio State University. And she was also, for a number of years, Director of Pharmacy at Stanford Hospital in, uh, and affiliated with UCSF. Uh, and also prior to that, uh, I've known Sarah when she was at University of Kansas Medical Center. Uh, she's a past president of ASHP and also a Whitney Lecture Award recipient from ASHP. So welcome, um, Sarah. And hopefully, um, hopefully this will work. I still see, I still wanted. All right. Okay. So we'll go ahead and start. I'm hoping I could do. Um, not gallery view, but I guess it's that's what it's doing. Okay, I'm trying to exit full screen. I speaker view. Okay, so hopefully this will work. Um, all right. So the first question I have is, uh, we want to learn more about your journey to uh, where uh, you uh, de develop or evolve as a in recognition as a leader. And in that uh, question, you may uh, want to uh, relate to us some key events that help shape uh, your career and also maybe key people that uh, influence you in your journey. So I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Terry. I'm happy to participate and uh, certainly in, intrigued to learn new things like this Zoom technology. Um, as you mentioned, I've been in uh, two academic centers. Um, I know your students are going to have great lives and careers and probably work in more places than I actually did. Um, I was a leader and also, as you mentioned, I was a professor and a preceptor with residents and uh, you know, I want to start out, I think, talking about leadership versus management, because one of the things as pharmacists people don't really recognize is that every pharmacist is already a manager, because the definition of management is making sure the right things are done correctly. Now, leadership, then, on the other hand, is what are the right things to be doing? And one of the things I want to challenge every pharmacist to think about is even if you don't intend to be, as I call it, a big L leader with a title, you are automatically, and we desperately need you to be a little L leader on your shift and in your practice. And as I've thought back to my decades of, of uh, pharmacy practice evolution, it's been the pharmacists and the little L leaders that helped us make this evolution. Uh, and just to give you some perspective, again, uh, I graduated in 1968. So granted, I've been around a while. But when I was in, in pharmacy school, we actually role played how to not tell a patient the name of their medication if they ask. Now think about how far we have come as a profession. And that means all of you as little L leaders and the big L leaders have helped us evolve the patient education, the counseling, the kinds of automated systems and health systems. Um, and so it's a part of everybody being a, at least a little L leader and hopefully some of you will become leaders um, on your own in the big L kind of world. Um, one of the things too that you mentioned I teach in the PLA that I try to emphasize is that leadership is an art and pharmacy is a science. And they're almost 180 degrees different. And what that means is, when we're dealing as a pharmacist with drug therapy, we have to be a perfectionist at, because we don't want to make any errors because that would harm a patient. And that's very legitimate and no problem. However, in being a leader and really the rest of our lives, we're in an art world. 
where we're going to learn by some mistakes and learn as we go. And that's okay. In fact, that's what it takes to really move things forward and evolve our, our practice. And that's where as young people, it's really you that are going to take over and say, where are the opportunities to do the right things on behalf of patients? And always remember that we exist for patients and their families. We oftentimes get lost sometimes, I think, in procedures and all kinds of things and lose touch with why we exist and it's the patients. So um, the other aspect to continue that I learned as I went was you really need to help the people that you work with. The technicians especially, uh, your colleagues, the other folks that you may interact with throughout the organization. Um, because to be a leader, you've got to have followers. And people only follow you willingly if they want to. They don't have to just because you have a title. Um, and another aspect of that is I know, and when I was in pharmacy school, we all competed with each other over grades, but don't compete with each other. You want to only compete with yourself and move forward in being better the next month, the next six months. Um, so don't compete with yourself. Um, as you kind of mentioned, I did my uh, residency and, and master's at Ohio State. When I was sitting in your place taking a, a, a course, I had no intent of going on. It was the last thing I thought I would do. But as I worked a couple of years, I was bored with practice and somebody had mentioned these residencies and master's programs. So I applied, it was the best thing I ever did. So another leadership lesson is keep learning. Um, the other thing that you'll be kind of amazed at is I went through pharmacy school with a slide rule because there were not calculators. In fact, the yeah. first calculator <laughs> I bought was $300 and all it did was add, subtract, divide, and multiply. And I used to say, now if the battery runs out, I throw it away, but that's not true because I've got an iPhone and I use that uh, or my Apple Watch. So you're always going to keep learning. And look at these various opportunities uh, in residencies, fellowships, uh, organizations have like the Pharmacy Leadership Academy, board certification. It all keeps you learning, and that's on behalf of our patients. So those are all leadership kinds of aspects that you're going to continue to evolve our services where they need to go in the future. Uh, another thing I'd like to challenge you with that I didn't realize for a long time was you can learn so much by just observing other successful people. And what you're building is really, I call it a repertoire of ways to do things and ways not to do things in trying to be influential as a pharmacist, no matter how you choose to uh, practice. Uh, if you think about your, the coaches you've had or the teachers or preceptors, you know, which are the ones that you've really learned a lot from? And think about, and they're going to be the ones that you don't ever want to interact again with, and that's, again, a learning because you don't want to do whatever they did, and you want to replicate what the, the coaches or the, the folks that you really respect were doing. My guess is they really cared about you as a person. They got to know you as a person. And they were helping you be all you could be. And in the process, they advanced their agenda. So it's a very much team kind of sport togetherness. Um, and what happens in once you are in your IPPEs and APPEs is watch how the pharmacists interact in all the various settings, especially things like meetings because human dynamics uh, are, are so uh, important to us and nobody ever says anything or, or one can't lecture on it particularly. But if you think about, I'm gonna be sitting someday as a pharmacist in that committee or I'm going to be chairing it, how would I get things done? What do you see working by people? Um, for example, does it, it help to you know, get angry or, or never say anything? No, it doesn't. But build what would, be, what would I be doing if I was trying to advance that agenda? Because that's all leadership. And remember that these leadership skills that you're going to be perfecting, you're going to use in your personal life as well. It's not just in your personal kind of life. Um, another aspect of observing the successful people is really professional organizations. 
not only being a member of a professional organization, but volunteering to serve on committees, maybe chairing those committees, being on the board of directors, um, because what you do is network with so many different people. It helped me a lot when I um, moved to California. I'd been in Kansas for 20 years, and when I moved to California, I knew enough other directors of health systems that I could call and say, you know, how, does it, how do things really work out here? And they recognized my name and would take my call because I'd help them along the way. They'll help me along the way. So the networking at meetings, don't just sit with the people that you already know. Go up and talk to people and ask them for their contact information and maintain it because you never know down the road who can help who really in this whole process because we're in this together. Um, in how we kind of evolve our career, and that's all leadership kind of techniques. Um, so observe other successful people, and again, you're building that repertoire of what to do and what not to do to be effective as you get into whatever, however you choose to have your practice play out. Uh, another aspect of leadership is really making or seizing your own opportunities. Don't wait for people to bring them to you. Figure out what you want to do, volunteer the, the thought, do the work, and don't be afraid to get outside your comfort zone. I mean, obviously, I had to learn technology. Uh, this Zoom is a new uh, thing for me, but you know, you, you learn it, you can buy a book, you can get on the internet, you can look at a video. It's so much easier today to learn these things. And it's quite frankly more fun than in college because you want to learn it and you know you're gonna need to learn it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, make and seize those opportunities. Um, I, uh, if someone would have asked me early on in my career, uh, roughly, um, you know, when would I retire? I probably would have said 65. It's kind of the standard answer, although I really hadn't given it much thought. But as I was at Stanford, um, some of my nursing friends were talking about an early retirement plan. And I thought, well, I'm, what is this? And, and it ended up that the hospital, if you'd been there 10 years and you were um, over 55, they would keep you in the employee health plan for what started out in 2003 to be $50 a month. Now, by the time I got to Medicare, it was $200 a month, but still you cannot buy health insurance for that. And I thought, you know, I, there are things I have had to put on the back burner. Let me see what I want to do. So I took that early retirement um, and I called a few folks um, so they knew it was my choice and that I didn't lose my job. Uh, and one of those folks was Henry Manassi, who at that point in time was the uh, executive officer of ASHP. And he suggested, why don't you come and do a scholar in residence with ASHP? We'll pay your expenses to live in Bethesda and um, you do a, a project and publish it. And I thought, well, you know, that's kind of fun. Why don't I try that? And so I did that. And because I'd always uh, taught leadership and had leadership residents, uh, I thought, let's survey leadership. Because what we had done, which we desperately needed to, was the education on clinical training. And so in 2004, along with ASHP staff help, I did a survey and we found um, that um, about, I think we surveyed 500 directors of pharmacy within 10 years, the majority of those, I think it was 80%, would um, not be in their position just because of retirement. And we also had an equal number of current practitioners and we asked how many would even consider moving into a big L leadership position and we only had 30%. So it didn't take statistics to say we had kind of a crisis. Mm -hmm. And so that publication, which was my commitment out of that, has really sparked the return to doing some leadership education, uh, has led to publications for me, uh, speaking. So you never know how things are gonna play out. I was just interested in living on the East Coast and kind of studying the Civil War and things that I hadn't been able to do when I worked. Uh, the other aspect that came along about that time was an opportunity to serve on a corporate board. And the board is Omnicell, it's a technology automation company. And I thought, you know, I've never been on a corporate board. There are not very many pharmacists, if any, that are actually on corporate boards. So I joined the corporate board and uh, 
you know, you, you use your knowledge and your leadership in another situation. I feel like what I've done is trade the DEA regs for the Securities and Exchange Commission regs. It's the same concept. If they say we have to do something, we have to prove that we're doing it and, and be, uh, do it and then prove that we're able to do it. So, you know, you translate your knowledge base and obviously knowing about medications and how we use them help me in that kind of setting. Don't, so don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. That's great. You're going to apply what you know and how you know to use it. Um, and along that time was sort of, um, you know, I thought, uh, could we do other things like publishing and things which I had never done much of, was not great in, in high school on, um, but we started Susan Cantrell was somebody I'd gotten to know in my SHP days, and she said, you know, could we do a letters book? from practitioners um, and so we started that and actually we're working now on I'm working on the sixth one of that series of leadership letters so you never know how these things are going to play out mm -hmm. so again don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone but take things to a new level I think would be my advice to you um, in terms of, of using any and all of these activities and have fun with whatever you're doing because you have a lot of choices and don't be a victim. If you don't like where you are, there is unfortunately no perfect job. <laughs> so you kind of have to have some trade-offs, but you've got lots of opportunities. And yes, yeah. everybody talks about it's competitive, but you know, it's always been competitive and we've always figured it out. Absolutely. So, um, Absolutely. You know. that's, yeah, that's wonderful. That's, that's yeah. great. Uh, I want to um, ask you this other one, um, you know, um, what do you think will be your legacy? Uh, what are you, you know, and I rephrase that because uh, uh, sometimes people say legacy, what are you talking about? Uh, in particular, what are you most proud in terms of your contributions to help advance the profession? And, and the most proud, I'll just say one thing. I mean, there's lots of things you're probably, or one or two things. Yeah, I think that's a great question. and something one doesn't cry tries not to think about too much, but I think it's the people along the way that I've gotten to know and that I've helped the residents and the students. Certainly we've built systems, we've advanced, advanced the profession, but it's been fun the people and you never know I had a pharmacist come up to me in Florida a year or two ago and he said you're the reason I'm in pharmacy and I kind of looked at him and he he said you know I was in architecture at, at KU and I was kind of frustrated interested in pharmacy and somebody told me to call you and you spent 30 minutes on the phone with him which I would have done I had no recollection of that but he said that's the reason I went into pharmacy oh, yeah. so you have no idea the kind of impact that you have on people just because of who you are, I think. So I think that is, if I have to answer the question, <laughs> my, my legacy. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. So, um, and my final question has to do, uh, since this is a history course, we'll be studying the decade of the 2020s. And one of the key, um, I believe, milestone in our profession will be the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, we're living in interesting times. But um, I think we'll study that and say that was a turn, like other events in history, that will be a turning point in 2020s, and especially as it provides opportunity for the pharmacy profession. Maybe you care to um, expound on that a little bit, how you right. see that. Yeah, I think that's a great example of we need to step up, see unmet needs, um, and and start doing them um you know be that testing be that we've we've picked up doing vaccines uh, over the years we there's so many of us we have great access to the public we also need to be the source of accurate true information mm -hmm. to the public um and they respect us a lot as pharmacists and i think there's many things of you know, can we help with the actual product selection once the diagnosis is done? We shouldn't hesitate to step into these areas of need. Uh, we often sometimes, I think, are our own worst enemies about worrying about will we make an error. But, you know, who else is better qualified knowledge-wise and understands the healthcare system to really help patients? And patients desperately uh, want that. The public desperately wants that help. So we need to see where those opportunities are and not just seize them, but make them. 
because this Absolutely. is a time that everybody, everything is up in the air. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Sarah White, for your insights and your time with us here this morning. Thank you.